happy market started. <coughs> so I'd like to keep on time. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. How great um, to see you. I, I really am um, excited about this. Um, I'd like to um, say a special welcome, first of all, to our guest speakers, Dr. Farhan Iqbal, Deborah Mosley, and Vivian Dunlop. And um, I'll have Trish, our secretary from the PNF, introduce them to you shortly. Um, I'm Lawrence Gage, the president of PNF. I'm really excited um, by the turn up this year uh, today. We've tried this year to um, switch the focus of the PNF from um, routine fundraising, which we're still doing a little bit of, um, to providing services to a value to parents and families. And um, the, the um, response tonight is really encouraging, so thanks very much. Um, so, uh, we have um, Tony Chan uh, from the school here as well. Tony will be talking shortly about the school's initiatives with um, um, mental health management. Um, we will then proceed to our guest speakers. We'll let them have their, their talks and then we'll have a discussion after that for as long as, it, as that goes. So just in order to, um, to manage the time, and to keep focus, we wouldn't mind just hang on to your questions until we end up with your Okay, so without any further ado, we might get started. So, um, welcome to Tony Sharman. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Behind me, I've got a couple of things I'm just going to show you that we're doing at, as a college. But I think it's probably, if I just start with uh, perhaps how, how we approach it, it's probably with our pastoral care program. It's about building relationships. So it's important that our home class teachers in the secondary and also our uh, teaching uh, teachers in the cl uh, primary classroom build those relationships with the students so they then know or see if there's some changes happening and then obviously can direct the student to, to uh, uh, the best way forward to, to uh, support them. I've just got here two, um, I guess, Size that we're using. My matters is what we're using in the second, it's Beyond Blue, um, as well as a number of other uh, government organisations are using that, and also if, if it links, it has lots of links in that. So I'm going to start with My Matters first, because that's a secondary one and perhaps one I'm more familiar with. But I, what it is, is a framework. It's not actually a specific uh, process that you go through or anything, but it's a framework. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. Um, that we can use. But I'm going to just show you how it's set up for the teachers. We have the old version, which is a paper version, which has lots of different activities that we can do uh, in classes or teachers can do uh, with their students. But this module here is probably a good idea of, of how it's set up. I'm going to come back and show you this introductory video because I think it's probably set the scene for tonight. But uh, it basically has, most of you will recognise Michael Carr Greg there. Uh, so he in, is in a panel uh, with a number of other experts and talks through various issues that come up. Um, there's also a humorous one, here's a school on how not to do it, but that's, this is for teacher training. But if I scroll down a little bit more, uh, lots of different things for staff to use here, but essentially there's four sets of manual, uh, modules, which has four modules in each, so it's about 16 modules. But some of these things that we can go through as teachers in terms of our preparation. But to scroll down a bit further, probably the most important thing is all the resources that are here. Um, uh, this one is Headspace, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, coming up. But if I scroll along here, just in, and anyone can access this site, but there's lots of different um, sites and information that you can use as well. And as teachers, we'll use these as part of our task force program. <coughs> So I just thought I'd quickly show you this intro. Hopefully the sound will work so a few talks with that. Cool, so. Mind matters in minutes. What is mental health? Part one, a definition. If a student came up to you and said, what is mental health? How would you answer them? Maybe you'd say, uh, it's obviously being mentally healthy, isn't it? To which your student replies, that's a tautology. It doesn't mean anything. And they'd be right. So maybe you'd say mental health is to do with things like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. 
But that's a list of disorders. It's not mental health. So maybe you're saying mental health is being happy. But then happiness is just a mood. Our lives are full of positive experiences that have nothing to do with happiness at all. So what is mental health? Here's one definition from the World Health Organization. Mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Now that's good, but it's long. We could boil it down to this. Mental health is our ability to respond to challenges. What kind of challenges? It could be anything, from a sudden encounter with a tiger to anticipating an exam. It could be something physical like an illness, something social like bullying or being left out. It could be an all-consuming crush on someone or a to-do list the size of a shark. It could be arguments with your family or a difficult essay, or the death of a parent, or a long distance move. The fact is that life rarely goes according to plan. And whenever we are beset by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, mental health is our ability to bounce back and stay on course. Now how do you get this ability? Are you born with it? No. Mental health can change. And the things that tend to shape it are called risk factors and protective factors. Protective factors, such as a sense of self-efficacy, a supportive family, or strong friendships, tend to cushion and support you, making it more likely that you'll maintain a state of positive mental health and stay on track. On the other hand, risk factors such as chronic illness or low socioeconomic status can have the opposite effect, exacerbating the impact of disruptions in your life and making it more likely you'll experience a decline in mental health. The good news is that protective factors can offset risk factors. And even better news is that protective factors introduced in early years can help shape positive mental health across a person's lifespan. So if a student asks you, what is mental health? You can say mental health is a state of mind that allows you to cope with the endlessly invented challenges life throws at you. And that state of mind can be at any time eroded by risk factors or supported by protective factors. That's a great explanation and your student will love and respect you for it. But it does raise another important question. If you wanted to improve the mental health of as many people as you possibly could, what do you think would be the best time and place to do that? So we work through these as staff. Um, at the moment we're working individually, but some of this will be used um, at staff meetings and introduction just like we've done tonight. Essentially, um, it gives us a platform or framework which we can base our pastoral care program on. Kids Matters is the uh, same organisations, Beyond Blue and the uh, primary, uh, sorry, the Principals Association uh, have run this as well. But if I just highlight, I thought I'd just show for obviously schools got a heap of resources, but for families there's lots of resources as well. And I thought I'd just go through some of those now. So if I just scroll down a little bit. It's so it, if you're looking for a site with lots of different information, there's lots of different uh, links that you can go on to there. So it's Kids Matter, it's uh, for, probably for primary students, but it also has lots of resources and links. Mind Matters, also has a link to the right at the bottom, but I thought I'd just show you those quickly, um, just so you've got those as, as future reference. If you just do a search for Kids Matter and uh, all Mind Matters, you can find those. I'm not going to take anyone else's thunder, but I just thought I'd use that just as a quick introduction uh, to uh, Healthy Minds. So if I finish there, no one else, I'll just shut this down then. So that's it. Thanks very much, Tony. All right, great introduction. Um, that's where the school's up to this point. I'd just like to um, bring Trish and Farmer up. Trish is Secretary of the Bear, and um, Trish has been a powerhouse organiser this month. So thanks very much, Trish. If I um, can hand over to you, please introduce the speakers. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Um, now, our first speaker tonight, um, in no particular order, is Dr. Sohan Iqbal. Um, Farhan is a consultant psychiatrist at the Toowoomba Hospital. He's a colleague of mine, but I think maybe more importantly tonight, he's also a parent here in Concordia. So Farhan's going to um, talk to us tonight about normal teenage behaviour, um, so, uh, again, some uh, early onset of mental health concerns, and touching on as well the more severe signs of mental illness and where we can look for support um, across the board in the mental health service. Welcome, Jeff. 
actually covers some of it, but mental health is probably the bigger sort of chunk the base of the pyramid, and we all have problems and sometimes feel a bit low, sometimes a bit upset, sometimes we get a bit of a we get some strange ideas. Uh, and then you move on that spectrum, and then on the far end, probably people like me sit, who work with psychiatrists, and then there's this huge range in the middle, and what can we do? Vast number of people, vast number of kids, fortunately fall into this middle of it. Hopefully they'll sort of raise their knees just like they do, skin their knees, fall of the bites, get back, back onto them again. I think that's the overarching message. With a little bit of time spent on what are these really weird disorders at this end, which can cause a bit more trouble and how to access help for that. And try to demystify it because there are lots of myths about it. So I've just closed down the book of Bailey Henson and I realised that in Toronto there are lots of myths about Bailey and what happens to many young old people and hopefully debunking some of those myths that actually it's a fairly just normal spectrum of society and people just sit on different parts of it. So just going back to the children's side of things. So I'm a parent, I've got one child who's 14 who's in grade 9. So we're probably going to make references to him in between as well because I'm sure that all of our struggles are the same. Sometimes they come back home what they allege is bullying at school, the teachers picking on them, and some other things going on. So maybe I'll make some references to that as well, how kind of I found my way, but then going back to the formal bit. So one thing which is important to say is that you've got the younger kids who probably get a lot more support in primary school, or at least that's been my experience. So the teachers are generally a lot more molly cuddling, if you like, and suddenly they hit middle school, secondary school. Life changes. And it changes partly because our expectations of kids at that age, once they hit sort of 12, 13, is that you're growing up, you're going to become adults, so you better prepare yourselves for the real world. What are you going to do? What grades are you, are you going to get? What sort of jobs would you like to do? And that's just one part of the story. So there's a huge amount of pressure, but then we've got the whole biological development going on. And that's a really, really big pressure on, on kids. So suddenly the hormones start to as well. So we realize we're changing, our thinking's changing, the body's changing, and we're not sure what's normal because there is no anchor point where they can say this is normal. So for people like me who've got 40 years of normality, something changes. So well, 40 years I've been like this, now it's changed. These kids haven't had that experience. This is their first experience of something happening. And then you've got the media telling you what it should be like. Then you've got the kids around, and then you've got your parents who say, I hope puberty can be delayed in some way, shape, or form. They don't start talking about girls and boys and God knows what. <laughs> so there are huge amounts of pressures which are going on. So girls traditionally probably have been at the receiving end of a bit more than boys, but as a, as a parent of a boy, I can tell you that six packs are big trouble. <laughs> and the times when I've had to say that it's swimming today and you're going to have to go, um, it's, been, it's been difficult. But these are what kids are actually trying to negotiate. A couple of years after that, then you start sort of seeing that the girls and boys start mixing with each other, and they're now they're starting to negotiate relationships. And that's another trouble uh, as to how, how, how do you do that? If you break up with somebody, how do you break up in a civilized way? And then how are you going to be friends with the bloke who's actually going to be going out with the same girl or boy for that matter? How do you negotiate that? And they struggle, just like probably all of us have struggled at various points in our own lives. We've got the academic pressures going on as well. So they're going hand in hand, trying to negotiate that, trying to negotiate this other side of interpersonal relationships. They're not quite sure. They're having these growth spurts. The clothes are becoming shorter, and the muscles are developing. They start pointing with each other. And they don't even realize how strong they're becoming. The testosterone is kicking in. They're getting bulkier, and sometimes they punch a bit too hard. Sometimes they shout and scream. And sometimes they're so egocentric that they don't realize of things that they're saying are actually pretty hurtful. That's not just to parents, it's actually to their friends as well. So here they are negotiating all of these things. Now, the vast majority of kids are probably going to be able to negotiate those difficulties with a little bit of help from you guys, from the parents, sometimes by us being the bogey guys, who will say, well, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And that will just allow them to, to have a bit of a reality check. But the teaching staff over here are hugely important as well. And it's not just the teachers in the classroom. I think it's important to recognize that there are other people within the school. Chaplain, for instance, who are very influential. I've discovered that uh, Ms. Eden has it as very important over here as well. Nurses can be very important as well. Or Mr. Hobbinot, who does running in the morning, might be very important for the, for, for the children as well. Just allowing them to develop their skills, feel proud about certain areas. 
because they might be struggling in one area, but being able to do something very well in another area can actually just allow them the space to actually maneuver that. Vast majority fine. They're plodding along, they're getting reasonable enough grades. If they want to study maths or English or do an apprenticeship, they'll find their way. And I think we shouldn't worry too much about it. And I think I've spoken to a lot of parents now who say, oh, but they're teenagers. And I think that's important to remember that there is a normal sort of thing that happens within the teenage years. Sometimes they're rude, they might swear a bit, they might push you around a bit, so do the same to their parents, uh, to their friends as well. But well, that's within the norm. The bigger things, though, that I suppose as a parent, but also as a psychiatrist, I then start pricking my ears about, is the second layer of the pyramid. And that really, if I can just be very blunt about it, is um, when kids actually aren't forming those social relationships, when they haven't got their friends. To use that sort of obvious phrase, very mentioned, so they're slightly outside the main groups within the school. So now they're struggling. They're negotiating or trying to negotiate all of these difficulties, but they haven't got those protective factors around them. That struggle is going to be really, really difficult. They're going to be sort of really going around in their heads about what's going on. And in the media, you probably hear a lot about self-harming. I think that's the sort of context where some of these things can occur. Of course, it's not only in those circumstances. It can be that people start grouping together with similar difficulties. And then they start sharing what they do, such as self-harm or restricting their diet. So the problems can be magnified through those groups as well and become even more difficult. As it becomes worse, then you may edge towards suicidality. And it's dreadful to see when teenagers are saying, well, life's not really worth living. And I certainly in the past I dealt with kids who felt that life wasn't worth li living and have actually tried to take their own lives. And it's, it requires quite a lot of work to try and ensure that actually there is a life beyond whatever you were experiencing. I'll leave that to headspace to do with because I think that's where the most of the work does, does actually occur. The vast majority of those children, again, with help, could probably get better and find their way. I think that if we look back in our own times, I think to an extent we will probably suffer some things and we probably know of some people who had difficulties, and they probably remained like that for a couple of years, and then they managed to find a way. They found some teacher, they might find a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or uh, an uncle and aunt from under the wing, and things became better for them. So we're talking about this it, it's a very close, tight circle, family and school, and there are people around as well that can help and support and, and allow things to develop. I've noticed that trauma is not really a uh, hotbed of drugs, even though people over here believe so, but coming from the UK, where some of the cities, inner cities in particular, if you said that children, teenagers didn't use drugs, uh, that might be a marker of being alienated, <coughs> because you're not moving in the circles, everybody's doing drugs, why is your kid not doing drugs? So fortunately, over here, that's not the case. That would be another sort of, along with the self-harm side of things, drugs <coughs> would be another area which I would prick my ears up about. <coughs> Having said all of that, when people are having problems, and kids are not immune to them, as I've said, um, we've, we've, we've sort of moved in the direction of saying, well, we need to have some sort of formal help. And, and I think that's got a very valuable sort of place. I do want to emphasize one additional thing, that informal sources of help can be immensely helpful. And informal help sort of, if I think about sort of I moved from England and my son coming with me, adjusting over here, it was a difficult time. <coughs> he doesn't like talking to anybody, so he doesn't want to see a counsellor at all. Well, Dad, you're a psychiatrist, what the good does that do to anybody? You can say, yes, no, I take the point, take the point. But the best thing for him has been joining a soccer club. And his coach is taking him under his wing, and mm -hmm. sometimes he's like, come along, you just come along with me and we'll be fine. That's been the best thing for him. And things have improved, they're not perfect, but they've improved immensely. So, I would definitely say not to dismiss the informal sort of support structures mm. which are available. If they like singing, they like dancing, they like playing, whatever it is, there can be something which can push kids uh, away from those troublesome bits, allow them to create a sort of support structure which is really valuable for them and then flourish, whatever their stress might be. Now, I'm going to move away from all of these things because that's the vast majority, and I think the important thing is to remember that it is about 95% of our children are probably going to fall into this category. 
I'm the one who deals with a smaller chunk. And I'm not a child psychiatrist, I'm an adult psychiatrist, but I do see people who have come through from that end. And I'm only going to mention two or three disorders which we worry about a lot more, and I'll briefly mention about them, uh, and, and how to access them. Amongst girls, you're probably looking at eating disorders, and probably more or less all of us in the room would know somebody whose children have eating disorders. And it can be a very devastating condition because food is such an integral part of family lives, social lives, and our normal development, especially for children, when they start eating, it's sort of it's not just on one front that I'm not taking nutrients in. It's also almost like cutting off all of that emotional support, the social network. It's, it's a literal blocking off of everything. And the helplessness that, it, that that engenders. So if you think of a 14 or 15 year old who's just refusing to eat and is wasting a lot of it's a very good situation to be in. And, and so that's one condition which I think is immensely important to remember. Amongst boys, a bit later, probably more towards the 16, 17 year old mark, we're looking at the development of disorders like schizophrenia. And what we tend to find is that even though the caricature might be about people hearing voices and things like that, that might not be the initial presentation. Initially, you might just see a bit from everything. So you might not be very keen on joining in with their, whatever their normal activities might be, restricting themselves to their computers. Like boys do that normally, but a bit more than that. So not talking to their friends. We're drawn from family as well. A bit of disorganization. Academic performance aren't we going down. If those things are happening, it is worth just checking out the doctor as well. What to do next? Is this something which we need to seek for more help for? If there are further signs where they're definitely articulating that there are strange things that are going on, and if they are saying that they're hearing things when things aren't happening, accusing you of using them, all sorts of paranoid ideas emerging. Not all of them may have schizophrenia, but it's definitely worth actually having an assessment done at that point in time. And the reason for that is a very straightforward one, but if we can catch people earlier, maybe we can do something at an initial stage and change the trajectory. And what I do remember from my teaching, um, which, which one of my teachers will talk about child and adolescence function, is this. It said that schooling is so important and fundamental in our society, and it's a bit like an aircraft table. And you've got this sort of trees and hedges in front. And if you don't push the aeroplane to the right speed and give it a right angle, it's going to crash into the trees over here. And unfortunately, we don't give people very many chances in, our, in, in, in life. It's now going through school, getting the apprenticeship, getting into university that's going to set the scale for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their lives. So in some ways, it's important to catch them here make sure that they get over the trees so that they don't crash. And even if the flight's going to be shallow for the next few years, that's fine. Because once they're over the trees, well, you can always change and pull up. If they crash at that point, then unfortunately, what they'll do is they'll lose their social group. What they're going to see is their friends going away to university, then being left back. And it's an interesting one seeing, as a psychiatrist, these patients, because you think, well, you can treat the disorder, but what about the losses? That that they're accruing all around them. And that can be quite devastating for younger people because they're seeing people moving on and they see themselves being sort of just left behind in a way, not being able to do things. With appropriate supports, I think that, that's quite possible. And quite a lot of people will sort of have that sort of turbulence of two, three years after school. Well, that's, that's fine. Just one final quick mention about depressive disorders and anxiety sort of things. Um, I'm very anxious, I'm very anxious right now, <laughs> always have been, um, and, and so anxieties are very common amongst kids, you just need to ask them actually, and some of them will actually display those anxieties, and how they do that is by refusing to do things, they'll say, no, I don't really want to do that, and pretend that they're okay, just probe a little bit further and you start finding that actually they're not quite okay, there's a lot more under the surface that meets the eye. Similarly, people becoming depressed, uh, children becoming depressed, and they don't present with the typical picture that adults saw of what you find in the newspapers. They don't just sort of stop eating and then lose weight, and the typical sort of present, they might laugh, they might even watch films, they might even go out with their friends, and they can still be depressed underneath, because they're slightly different levels, they're not fully formed yet. But if they are constantly sort of having a very negative sense of their life, 
Uh, and they're becoming more withdrawn. I think the social aspect is important to keep in mind. Then it is good to just check out in your head, are they becoming a bit depressed? Do I need <coughs> more help for, for, from my child? The good news is that by and large, they do very well with psychological treatments. Um, and again, you can get them back onto the track. So that's all I really have to say. The take home message, the vast majority of kids are going to fall into this roughly 95% category, where they're going to graze their knees, and that's fine, you thought if I get back on the bike, and things will be okay. Yes, there are these formal structures within the family, beyond the family, and further, further on as well. However, sometimes you might need some more formal support, and headspace and all those place, uh, things that are being developed now will definitely form uh, part of that sort of structure, not to forget the informal bits. Um, so churches form part of that as well, uncles and aunts, distant friends, anybody could, could uh, to form part of that informal structure. And then you've got that very rough end at the end, but again, there is help available for that, that sort of category. And the way to access that is, if it's not urgent, then just go to your GP and talk to them about it. Okay? When they're under 16, they're going to be very confident, they'll just do a referral. 17, things start getting dodgy once they cross 18, then you can hit the barrier of confidentiality when they're adults and parents and all of that. <coughs> so, but once they're the 16 end, GPs are usually quite all right and they'll just do it for the same the same the kids are. If, however, you suddenly find that things have crashed and have come down very rapidly, then I think you've got some of the yeah. things here. Yeah. So the Sun Cards over there, it's, uh, there's a team called the Acute Care Team. They provide 24 hour sort of assessments. Now, during the office hours, actually 9 to 4 ish, um, child psychiatry people will do the assessment themselves. They've got a team, so usually the member of the team will do the initial assessment. They'll go back to the psychiatrist, and then the whole team will have a discussion around what needs to be done or not. And it might be simply to say, well, actually, we're not so worried about this child. We appreciate that the parents are very worried, the next is worried. We're not so worried about this, but we think this and this might be helpful. Okay, so they might just give a letter of advice and send you back. If there is need for their involvement, then they will get involved as well. Um, but after hours, then the acute care team, which just provides 24 hour care for every adult, old age, young people, whatever it might be, they will do an assessment. You just need to turn up at the ED and uh, present with whatever the acute problem is, and the acute care team will do the assessment and then sort of push you in the direction that's required. We do have a, uh, an inpatient unit over here, so hopefully that won't be required. But we do get kids with eating disorders or with suicidal tendencies who do get admitted over here. So it's a very nice unit. Uh, people do get very well looked after over there. Sometimes that's required, it does, does happen. And the final myth busting thing that I wanted to say is that we don't lock people up for the rest of their lives. It used to happen. Um, we closed down one ward. Um, some of the other ones may need to remain or uh, in a smaller way. But it does not happen. In fact, you might find the opposite thing where we'll say, no, 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 we want to go out, we want to go out. And one of the reasons being that, well, if the problem is out there, then the best place to solve it is, is going to be out there, rather than in the hospital where you can say, oh, it's all fine now. And the child picks up, and then you say, out you go, now where the problems were, and you still don't know how to sort them out. So the tendency will be to try and push it back into the community. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And any questions? Of uh, what I feel will give you a complete uh, picture. Could you put your hand up if you've had some, some knowledge of headspace at all, heard of headspace? Okay. 
Um, you've probably seen the investments on the television, I've been on the they seem to be bombarding me, but I'm guessing it's like uh, anything, and if you're actually involved in things, you notice them much more strongly. Um, Headspace is certainly around, it's best known as a service for uh, young people with mental health issues. Our service is for 12 to 25 year olds, it is a free service. Um, we really look at the mild to moderate early intervention um, end of the spectrum in terms of mental health. Pat Bagori, quite rightly, um, I believe, had one of those, and I'm very proud to be part of the, the Headspace concept because it really is looking at that whole person. And um, really, as, uh, I'm sorry, Pat, uh, uh, had said earlier, it really is about that early intervention. The sooner that we can start giving that young person strategies so that they can develop more positivity around their life, the better. And that's very much what Headspace is about. And whilst mental health is probably one of the key strategies that we use, it's not the only strategy. So we actually have four prongs, or five prongs actually, to what we do at Headspace. Um, we have a mental health service, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We also have a physical health program, um, and that also we are, currently in negotiation with a GP and hopefully that will happen fairly soon. We will have a GP available at Headspace. That will provide services obviously um, as any GP will, um, but often in an environment which is very youth friendly. Our space has been designed by youth themselves and that's part of our, our third strategy and that's about around community engagement and something that we've already spoken about is the importance of young people being part of our community feeling as though they're able to contribute and finding a way in which they can. So right from the very beginning, Headspace has been designed by a team of young people who we um, call the Youth Engagement Subcommittee, only because they want to be called Yes and not Yet. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> No logic apart from that, and hey, you know, it works. <coughs> so the Yes crew have designed the inside of the building or as much as they can. Um, within the constraints, yes, but you've only got this bucket of money, so. <laughs> um, in reality, it has created a very <coughs> youth-focused physical environment, so the young person will answer that. The other thing that we're doing with the physical health is that um, I, I have a strong belief, particularly at that mild to moderate end, as we were talking about having the soccer engagement, not only is it that mentorship and sense of belonging that that young person gets, it's also that physical exercise and um, certainly I have a very dear friend who's suffered from chronic depression all her life and she uses physical exercise, running, doing something like that, always as a way to get herself out of, you know, that doldrums when she gets into them. Um, and it seems to me as though there's a very direct um, relationship between physical uh, um, exercise and our mental health. It's part of our wellbeing. <coughs> So um, we're already offering yoga classes one afternoon and give a week. Um, I'm in negotiation to have a physical trainer there as well to um, offer uh, various programs that will encourage young people to, you know, um, do the sort of things that are probably part of any good educational program really and it's probably one of the reasons why it is part of the school programs. But for many young people who are disengaged, who are most likely to be the young people that will walk through our doors, um, that might be something that they haven't felt that they can actually participate in in a safe way. And I guess providing a safe place is the number one um, objective of this place. That a young person can walk in the door, feel as though it's friendly, feel safe to be able to, um, to discuss whatever issues they might have. We also have vocational and career support. Um, and so a lot of young people have no idea what they want to do. And that, to them, is a barrier to actually, I guess, getting on that runway and taking off. So they're just going round and round in circles in their own mind, don't have the strategies perhaps for some um, way of getting a job if they've been unemployed, um, or maybe just really unsure about career or even educational you know, programs that might be totally stressed out with exams. That might be their one issue. But it has got the, it's creating um, the skill set in that young person so that they can best be able to with um, the, the different issues that we all have to face in our lives and building that resilience. So we have got a vocational and career education 
Um, support person who comes in one day a week as well. Um, and community engagement is also a really critical part of what we do. And we ask young people and invite them, please join our Yes group. And part of um, what that Yes group already set up is an LGBTI group, um, LGBTIQ maybe. Um, uh, and because we know uh, there are few resources for young people who have identified as having alternative sexuality um, in Toowoomba where they can feel safe and they can actually discuss that um, with others. And so we have our clinical services managers involved in supporting the development of that. Um, most headspaces do have a similar group, which is normally called a radio group. I don't think this group have self-named themselves, but we've only been open for not quite two months, so we really are in the fledgling stages. But um, certainly for young people who might feel isolated um, in that, uh, and we are very mindful also of um, the issues that, that surround those kind of issues. We're working with what was Family Plan in Queensland now through relationships um, and developing a sex talks um, program as well for young people um, who are, as we've already um, discussed, they're going through these huge hormonal changes as well as trying to negotiate their way around a whole lot of things where they're just not feeling safe, not feeling good about life. Um, and so often issues around sexuality and sexual health can be impacted. And so one of the things that we really want to do is to support those young people. And also there will be a, um, a similar program <coughs> for parents and carers to best be able to support young people. Because I think probably when I first stepped into this role, and I'm not a clinician myself, I've come from an educational background, I can remember um, hearing a story which really touched on me about a young man who was starting on the pathway, but sadly of, of, I suppose, becoming more and more isolated. And one of the things that really touched me um, was that his sense of reality obviously was fairly different to other young uh, people in his peer group sense of reality. And for parents that's pretty scary because what do you do when a young person appears to be going in a different direction to what your expectations are? And not only for a parent but also for his own peers and his own friends. They were no longer standing by him, mainly I believe because they were afraid, they weren't sure um, how he was going to behave. And so that essential empathy, which I think is our very humanness, was lost for this young person. Um, and it seemed, as I was hearing the story, I was thinking, wow, it's, it's such a tragedy that um, <coughs> the parents you know, lose that confidence um, and possibly in some cases they feel shame um, about a child's behaviour and so they don't feel safe themselves that they can go um, and, and speak as a parent, I'm really concerned about my child for this reason. So it's one of the things that I'm <coughs> hugely passionate about, um, is about supporting um, parents to best be able to, to support young people when those parents themselves are feeling lost at how do we, how do we actually um, support this young person through this, this difficulty. And also, um, I'm talking to Nicole Gibson, who's one of my very favourite people. Does anybody know? She's um, uh, a mental health commissioner, probably the youngest mental health commissioner, I think. Um, but she runs a program called Rebel Rouge, and it's a program where she is really looking for developing within our whole community, in, in, in school communities, <coughs> a, a capacity to be able to be a peer support person um, so that young people really learn true empathy so that they can actually sit with the person who's struggling and to listen to them. And, um, and that obviously it's not to be anything more than a good friend, really, just to stand by them uh, rather than doing what we, we often do, and that is to cross the street if we see somebody coming who's a little bit too difficult. Um, and it's, a, it's not that we are uncaring <coughs> when we do that, but I think that's our human nature. If we feel vulnerable ourselves because we're unable to support somebody, then that's something um, that I'm really passionate about, supporting young people so that they can also stand in there and help young people as needed. So whilst Headspace, we are certainly looking at that 12 to 25 group, I'm also seeing that they sit within a community, they sit within a family, they sit within some other context, and we've got to give that context power and empowerment and the capacity to best support that young person as well. 
Um, <clears throat> so, one of, um, one of the things I was going to mention just when we were talking about mind matters earlier as well was um, on, one thing I've, you might be aware of the Wheel of Wellbeing in England, I believe, I, I believe in London, it's fairly uh, well known. Um, have a look at Google Wheel of Wellbeing. It's just a beautiful um, model, I suspect. For young people, it does have, it is quite empowering. Some of the headspaces in Brisbane are already using this as a model. It's an online program and you can register. Um, and I won't go into too much, too much detail, but you can actually register and say, what am I doing for my own well-being? So it's a preventative strategy and about building that resilience in a young person, certainly at that early intervention. And then Will of Wellbeing is one of the strategies that I'm interested in working more closely with. Um, we have, we're actually having our official launch on the 22nd of September, so coming up pretty soon at 10.30. The um, community is invited. We'd love for you to come along if you're free. And um, we also have a chronic disease um, program coming up on the 21st of October, which will be an invitation to um, parents and friends. Um, and this is really looking at the impact of chronic disease on a young person's capacity to negotiate their own way once they've left school. Schools are beautiful places and they take care of young people with chronic diseases, but we know statistically that um, um, there are a range of chronic diseases that need that young people need to actually uh, develop strategies as they move out of school and into um, employment or for the study, depending on where they're going. And, um, and so that would be very much about talking through uh, how do you do this, how do you look after your own needs in an environment outside the school environment. Um, probably. <laughs> anyway, so we've pulled the questions over, um, I guess, and uh, just to see where you are. Yeah, oh, you're yeah, where am I? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought you'd all know that. <laughs> I'm at number one Snell Street, so um, if you know the engine room cafe and if you do lovely coffee, you probably know uh, Railway Street, where the next street back behind Railway Street. Mm -hmm. um, going up the hill, the Salvation Army. This guy the opposite of us. Yeah. Anyway, so number one, Snell Street. My office looks directly at the railway station down Royal Street, so there, that gives you a really good clue <laughs> about where we are. So we are relatively close to Grand Central. Oh, and the other really exciting news is that we are intending to, and I think you're the first people I've actually said this publicly, but um, we are working towards our thing on Saturdays as well. Because we recognise again, as part of my strategy of helping parents, that's a time when there is possibly more better capacity to go. Um, at present we offer services between uh, 9 and 5. And maybe, we have got time to maybe just describe what happens on just the journey in. So if a young person is coming in this space, we do ask that they phone in advance. It is a, uh, people can drop in, but we do have limited services. Like we've got a relatively small staff at the moment as uh, with you know, being a new service. We've only got two access and intake workers. Um, so we prefer people to make an appointment in advance. But if they need to, for some young people it might be a very soft entry and we've had young people who might just come, have a look around and not actually commit to even having a conversation. And then they walk back out the door and then they come back two or three days later. <laughs> and, and so for some young people they really need to just check out, you know, hey, am I safe to talk to you? So we recognise that that's the case and we'll always work many young persons through the door. It's just to save them where you'd be asking to make an appointment. Um, they'll go through a screening process on telephone. We'll assess just how urgent that appointment might need to be. It may be something that's needed immediately, um, in which case obviously we'll move them in order to, to prioritise that young person. Um, in most cases we have so in, all, well in all cases, we've serviced somebody between one and, and the next five working days, which is a pretty good turnaround. Um, once they come to see us, then we'll have a full um, develop a care plan for that individual. Um, of about 200 young people who've come through our doors already, probably the majority um, would, would go on to a mental health care plan through a GP, where they're entitled to, to 10 sessions. So whilst I say it's a free service, um, that's for us personal limitations and why we say we're mild to moderate. You see, if we do have complex needs where somebody might be needing uh, 20 or 30 services um, per annum, 
uh, then that doesn't fit within our capacity because we are Medicare funded. Um, but a number of young people, um, and probably about 5%, have walked in the door, um, met with our assistant intake team, and walked out and went fine. Just having that one hour talk has been enough. And I'm quite surprised how many young people have done on that. It's just for many young people, at last I've had somebody that can actually unburden on um, and, and problem solved, and then the door's open. The door is always open to come back, and that's what we say. So if they feel, and it's, it might be a time there, if I go out in the community and they go, whoa, I've got knocked again, I've got to come back and have my conversation. Or they might just, hopefully, say I'll have a new life.
friends. So we try to give you information about what it is to have a, a family member with that particular diagnosis. You know, what it's all about. One of the stories that I love to tell is um, when I first started at Anorathy, one of the very first carers that I met had come out and she said, all I have is a, is a diagnosis of a piece of paper. And it was actually around her 16-year-old daughter. She'd gone up to the hospital and the diagnosis was schizophrenia and the piece of paper she was talking about was a prescription. And she was like, what do I do now? My daughter, she's 16, I was, oh, she's got schizophrenia, I've never heard of it, I don't know what it is. You know, so there comes arachne, walking alongside her saying, this is how you navigate the mental health system. This is sort of what you can expect around, you know, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. These are the different medications. Um, you know, everything to do with that particular family, you know, we've been there with them, you know, every step of the way, teaching them, alongside them, supporting them, putting them in contact with other people who are going to be similar sort of, you know, um, like life stories at the moment as well. Um, so Arachne is, is, we've been here going for, what, two years? Yeah, two years in Toowoomba. But Arachne's been, as I say, it's right across, um, it's national. Um, there's, we've got a few uh, different houses down in Brisbane. So the Arachne house in Toowoomba is actually set up as a rest part house. Um, so we have a home in Grangeville, which is really beautiful. It overlooks Tabletop, if I can just cut down that horrible tree in front of me. <laughs> but we just have this really good view of that tree goes, everybody's going to play me, I'm sure. <laughs>
If you'd like to come to any of our services, you know, you're more than welcome to come. Okay? So you don't need to be registered as a carer. As long as you have some sort of emotional connection with somebody who has mental illness or you think that they have a mental illness, it ticks my stats box when you come. <laughs> so if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you. Oh, yes, we're across the boat now. So we have support groups who go out to Gungawindi, um, well, our areas to Gungawindi, we don't go to the support group there, but it's all the way around Gungawindi, Waga, Dolby, um, Kingaroy, and we go down to Lowood as well. So our area is huge, um, and we will travel, we'll go, you know, so if you can't come to something that we do in Toowoomba, very good have to take it out to where, or do things one on one. level would be to find out what it is <coughs> and then try and put it in a certain context. Of course, yeah. it has to do with an appropriate context of a nine-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing which I do say is that sometimes people get into, especially with anxiety disorder, sometimes it's not that you can tackle the anxiety full stop, but what you can do is to prevent it getting worse. So with anxiety, usually people will fall into the yeah. trap of doing avoidance strategies. So, oh, are you getting anxious because you go to school? And I briefly mentioned about the swimming pool. No, no, you are going to go to school, then the swimming pool is there, and the kindest possible way, of course. So, we then to be aware this from happening. So, oh, don't worry, don't do the homework, and I'll talk to the teacher. That will reinforce something, and I think that in some ways, when you were talking about the boundary setting, that sometimes we can do things which can give transient relief from something painful that actually complicates the matter further on. So you have to bear in mind that the nine-year-old will grow up 10, 11, and the pool will just grow out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that probably is the case with the vast majority of kids. Um, but some, it may get worse. I suppose that without making it clear to an interview in the open, <laughs> sometimes it's an issue that it's not restricted to one area. And I think that's when, if, it, if it's sort of pervasive, so it's, anxiety in situation A, B, C, and D as well, then I think that's when one may become a little bit more concerned and then we want to seek advice and what's going on over here. It's not situation specific, it's actually a lot more pervasive than that. And then I think that that would be a bit more serious than just sort of homework. But, but some kids are confused. Um, like there is a normal dedication and, yeah. and I think that sometimes we think oh everybody should be able to stand on the stage and do a dance and sing in a loud voice well it's not going to be the case there are going to be people on the spectrum and sometimes it's, it's all right um, I used to be anxious as well and this is how I manage and you probably have strategies that you've used yourself in life and sometimes just saying that well mommy gets anxious about this how about that? Yeah, 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 cool. Thank you.